Welcome to Teaching Artist Podcast, a show dedicated to discussions of teaching art to kids, making art, and how those things overlap and feed each other. I'm Rebecca Potzagire, your host, an artist and educator. so much for listening. It has been so wonderful diving back into this third season Ah, after a bit of a break in the fall and winter. I hope you're enjoying these episodes as much as I enjoy having these conversations with artists and educators who have so much to share. It has also been a lot trying to keep up with a weekly release while working full time, making art, doing a little bit of curation and parenting. I'm always striving for this elusive balance and I struggle to take things off my plate, but it's a work in progress. I am a work in progress as I commit to regular studio time and more time dedicated to playing with my daughter while not also doing something else, (laughs) I am moving to a bi-weekly release here. So I know I've been a bit inconsistent, which goes against all the advice I hear, but life is inconsistent. Some weeks are busier than others, and I rarely manage to work ahead enough to have that inconsistency not matter. So it will still be a bit inconsistent for a little while as I'm sticking to dates that I've already committed to with guests, but I do plan to switch to bi-weekly releases in the future just to take some of the pressure off. I have been working on automating some aspects of the show to help and I work with a wonderful editor for some episodes but this shift to bi-weekly release, I think will be a big help. Just sharing it already is helping me relieve some of the overwhelm. I also hope to model this idea of removing things from your plate. What can you slow down on or stop to bring some relief? Okay, on to a great episode with Mariana Jimenez Edwards. Mariana talked about learning to draw and how her teachers and parents supported her creativity. The way she shifted from teaching full-time and feeling the burnout so many of us have felt was inspiring. I loved hearing how she found a semblance of balance with part-time teaching and part-time art making as she re-emerged as an artist. And I love that term too, re-emerging. We think of the emerging artist as this young artist ready to take on the world. But what about those of us who have kind of been there and then had something derail our art career in some way? Maybe it was teaching, maybe it was parenting, maybe it was all of the above. <laughs> I loved how she, she termed it as re-emerging. Mariana also talked about the move from Miami, Florida to Boise, Idaho, and how the culture shock affected her. She shared how she sought out community both locally and online through fellow artists and teachers. I loved hearing about her process and how she uses visual journaling alongside her students as an ongoing practice. Mariana Jimenez Edwards is a veteran high school art teacher who strives to incorporate a choice-based curriculum and believes in creating a space for students to experience how to see and think like artists. Having felt deficiencies in her own technical skills after leaving her high school art classes, teaching traditional drawing and painting skills that students expect is also important in her teaching practice. After teaching at one high school in Nampa, Idaho for nine years, a sense of inauthenticity crept into her mind. It felt strange to hold students to such high expectations if she was not holding them to herself. The need to return to her own art practice also became more apparent after the birth of her son, and then, more sadly, with the loss of her paternal grandparents, her most direct connection to her Mexican roots. Mariana stepped away from teaching the year before the pandemic to dedicate more time to painting, only to feel a void both intellectually and financially. She returned to teaching in the West Ada School District in 2020, 
and now Mariana is one of three other art teachers opening a brand new high school art department in the district at Owyhee High School. The daughter of Mexican immigrants, Mariana attended suburban public schools and has always loved learning. She studied at the San Francisco Art Institute, receiving a BFA in painting. Awareness of her indigenous heritage and Chicano culture blossomed during art school. Also during that time, visiting her grandmother's village in Oaxaca and various archaeological sites in central Mexico and Chiapas on separate occasions transformed that awareness into the passion and central ideas for her work. After art school, Mariana taught drawing and painting at two separate private studios. One of those studios belonged to classically trained Venezuelan artist Conchita Firgao, which led Mariana to want to explore a blend of Western realism with pre-Columbian knowledge. Drips, lines, and marks explore ideas of the fraying of time woven into a sense of existing within two different and distinct cultures. She draws and paints in oil, acrylic, and mixed media, incorporating cultural motifs, collage, portraits, animals, textiles, and patterns into her visual language. In 2019, Mariana received an Alexa Rose Foundation grant to travel to the Museo Textil in Oaxaca, Mexico, postponed due to COVID. In 2020, she created Ancestral Steering for the City of Boise Traffic Box Project. In 2021, she was again awarded with an Alexa Rose Foundation grant to purchase a camera for quality reference photos and documenting her portfolio through photographs and videos. She exhibits her work locally and continues to grow her professional artist practice. Mariana lives in Boise, Idaho with her husband and six-year-old son. When she is not teaching or painting, she's running, working out, or meditating. Let's hear from Mariana. So I am getting to talk with Mariana Jimenez Edwards today, and I'm excited to hear more about your teaching and your art making. And I like to start with that story of how you got into both of those things. Could you share your journey with us? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. I just wanted to say thank you right now from the beginning for having yeah. me on here. I have listened to your work, your podcast, and I get so inspired by the mm. other artists that are on your show. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I guess I'm kind of similar to a lot of the stories that I hear on your podcast, but you know, like a lot of people say that they've been creative ever since they were little kids and I feel as though I've always had a creative streak in me. I've always loved making things. And when I was little, I loved to draw pictures. And I loved my elementary art classes. I remember the first painting I learned about was Picasso's The Family of Salting Bonks. Do you know that painting? I don't think I do. Now it's I have like, to look it up. It's like the circus performers. Oh, yeah. Kind of all grouped together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My third grade art teacher taught us about artists and I remember her holding up this poster and we did the you know classic flower painting and oil pastels after we learned about Georgia O'Keeffe and I actually mm -hmm. won an award that year with that art teacher for that piece and the school like framed it and hung it up oh. and just a little background I went to a suburban school in Wisconsin even though my family lived in closer to downtown like regular Milwaukee city mm -hmm. so we were bused to these nice suburban mm -hmm. schools so I was fortunate to have that art experience in elementary yeah. school so in elementary school I had a lot of that exposure to making art and I didn't take art classes in middle school though so at the end of middle school, I knew that I wanted to start drawing. There was something telling me like, I want to draw. And I made a lot of initial attempts on a newsprint pad that I told my mom I had to have. And she got it for me. <laughs> and then before high school, I took a summer school art class. And in my mind, that was the way that I was going to get to take the advanced classes. Like if I got this art class out of the way in the summer... I'd be able to move up and not have to waste a year mm -hmm. on like that prerequisite class. So that summer was so amazing for me. I had a teacher. She wasn't the regular high school art teacher, but she just seemed very approachable. And I asked her like a million questions about you know, what art classes should I take and how do I get into art school? And she 
she just told me like everything she knew. She was just already starting to tell me. But the number one thing she told me to work on was drawing. She's like, you have to be good at drawing. So uh, knowing that I, I thought I had to focus, you know, a lot on drawing and I wanted to take photography and I wanted to like try everything. But in the back of my mind, I was worried, like, if I can't draw, I won't be able to get into art school. <laughs> and I didn't have my other art teachers weren't telling me your skills will come with time. Like I was concerned. I have to be able to do everything now. So I focused a lot on photography because I didn't trust my drawing skills. And so I applied to art schools with like a mixed portfolio of photography and drawing some paintings. I went to those portfolio days and like talked to the schools and I got into my first choice, the San Francisco Art Institute. And exciting. Yeah. And that first year, I didn't really know. I wasn't decided what I was going to be. Like, I told my parents, I'm going to go for photography. <laughs> but I loved, I loved my drawing and painting classes. It was mm -hmm. in that time that being around all those other artists that I just felt like I belonged there and I could experiment. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So. That's kind of how I got to art school. <laughs> and then while I was in art school, I did some peer tutoring. I was kind of good at the academics. So I would work with students who needed help on their writing. So that was kind of like my first intro to teaching. And so I never pictured in my mind that I would teach. But when I graduated, I wanted to stay in San Francisco. So I applied to all of these jobs, you know, like before and after school care teachers, that type of position. And I was hired at a, a studio. I don't know if you've heard of this company. They they used to have them like all over California. It was Kids Art. Oh, I feel like I have. Uh -huh. yeah. I don't think they exist anymore, but they had a specific method that they would teach. Mm -hmm. And so I went through the training. It was really intense. The whole time, the owner was like, you have to learn our method. Otherwise, you won't be able to work here. And so mm -hmm. I was like, okay. So I worked there only a year because I was, you know, I was running around the city working like three, four jobs to oh. live there. Yeah. And so I just kind of asked my parents, like, can I move back? I want to apply to grad school. And that was my intention to move back to Florida because my parents live in Florida. And with the intention of creating a portfolio, like this was my plan. Like I'm going to make a portfolio and I'm going to get into grad school and then I'll move out again, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was kind of slow going. When I was in Florida, though, I still needed to work. And where my parents lived, there was this little art studio. My parents were like, you should go check it out. And so I went and I just like walked in basically. And it was this artist who she was from Venezuela and she was teaching classical mm -hmm. drawing and painting, like in this little one room kind of mm -hmm. office space. And so yeah. I basically told her and her husband, like, you need me to help you. <laughs> <laughs> And they weren't it. even hiring. They weren't <laughs> hiring anyone. But I told them how I had taught at Kids Art and that I could help them implement a similar method into their business. And they were like, sure, yeah, help us. And so I was like, okay. That meant that I got to work alongside Conchita. Her name was Conchita Firgao. Mm -hmm. She trained at the Real Academy in Madrid in Spain. Mm -hmm. So I learned so much from her. And now that was like 20 years ago. This was like 20 years ago. Wow. And she, I should have back then, I wasn't conscious of this, but I should have like learned more from her because she had seven, eight children of her own. Mm -hmm. She had seven or eight children. <laughs> I can't remember. Wow. Exactly. <laughs> and she still painted and she still exhibited. And I don't know how she did it. I mean, it's just incredible. Oof. And yeah, I just learned so much from her just co-teaching and like mm -hmm. she would tell me you need to come in and you need to paint when the people aren't here. And I was, mm -hmm. so I was like, okay, thank you. And so I would, I would be there. And but at that time, I was really into running marathons. I still run, but I, I was 
training really hard. There was like something that I had to prove or something with running. And there was a, a guy in our running group, in my running group, who worked for the school board, like the, the Broward County schools. And he was like a curriculum specialist. And he was like, you should teach in the public schools. You know, it's a good gig. You, you know, you make pretty good money and you get health insurance. And so I was like, hmm, you know, I was like hemming and hawing about it. And uh, it just so happened. I'm like, okay, I'm going to apply. And he assured me that there were alternative methods for getting a teaching certificate because Mm -hmm. I I didn't have that, right? I didn't have an official teaching certificate. And I applied and I actually got hired at the high school that I graduated from. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I'm sorry for this long drawn out story, but I ended up working with my former photography teacher, Ms. Brzezinski. Mm. She's she's super awesome. And there were two other art teachers besides her. So there were four visual arts teachers. And so I, I landed a job working there and I worked there for three years. And at the same time, I was getting my teaching certificate through an alternative mm-hmm. certification. And that was my my formative years of teaching. And then I met my husband and I ended up here in Idaho. <laughs> wow. So is he from Idaho or you yeah. moved there for, yeah. He is from here. He was visiting a friend in Florida and, and we met. Yes. Wow. Oh, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I So many questions in there, but I, I love hearing the whole story and that full circle piece where you, you know, come back to yeah. your high school. That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to hear more about the method that you were using when you were working with kids art and then afterwards kind of sharing that method. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't really know what it's called, but now... Mm-hmm. Now that everyone's really into the atelier method and going back to the Barg drawings, you know, I feel like it's kind of similar, but we would work Mm -hmm. from, or the kids would work from, well, depending on the age, they would work from drawings like illustrations of animals or landscapes, and Mm -hmm. we would teach them how to draw the biggest shape first. And then we would help them place it. When they were little, we would actually draw the initial shape. And so mm-hmm. these pictures that they followed, they were like step-by-step pictures. Mm-hmm. They were already composed, already laid out. So we had to, the teachers had to place that first shape inside of the rectangle exactly where it was in the illustration so that it wouldn't confuse mm-hmm. the kids. And so... They would learn how to build up a drawing through overlapping shapes and erasing and then add pastel or they would watercolor. They would move through different materials. So they started off with Mm -hmm. pastel, dry pastel or chalk pastel, and then they would learn watercolor and then they would advance to acrylic, but they would always follow those types of images that came from these binders we had like tons of binders with I don't know who drew these pictures Mm -hmm. but they were all broken down all the shapes were broken down and they would learn how to look at the picture you know measure they had to measure Mm -hmm. like how big the shape was and where it was located like how it was angled and build Mm -hmm. up their drawing yeah it was Mm -hmm. (laughs) it was really intense and then the older students would work from still life. They would kind of rotate still life, Mm -hmm. landscape, or they would do copies of paintings, pretty well-known paintings. Most of them were impressionist paintings and they would have to match and mix the colors exactly as they were in the printed out pictures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was intense. It was, it was a lot of just, you know, checking and making sure they were on track. And they all wanted to, I mean, all of the students who were in these classes, they wanted to learn that way. And they were really proud of their work when they, when they were done. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then did it ever, did it move towards like more independence for the students, like where they're actually coming up with ideas and executing ideas? It sounds like a lot of building up the technical skills, Mm -hmm. which is really important. But I'm curious if, if that was sort of the main focus, or if then it also included that sort of ideation. It was mainly just technical. 
Yeah. yeah, the more advanced students, they would end up bringing in their own pictures that mm. they wanted to work from. But yeah, it was mainly right. just copying, not really like implementing their ideas or no. Yeah. Yeah. It's that type of learning. Mm-hmm. Right. And then I wonder, I know you talked about drawing and being like not as confident in your yeah. drawing skills at first. Do you feel like that? Maybe there's two questions in here. If you had had that as a kid, do you feel like that would have been helpful there? Yes. And then was it helpful later on even? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because I had never seen that type of system of mm. breaking things down. I mean, I had, you know, there are like those children's books, like how to draw baby animals. You know, I remember right. that book. That was I like the one. Those. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that I would I would look at I would try to follow mm-hmm. those steps but um yeah I'd never had had any of that kind of experience not even in high school I I yeah. wasn't taught to draw that way mm-hmm. that wasn't how I would how I learned yeah <clears throat> yeah it's so interesting hearing about it and just thinking about I mean I guess each individual artist is a little different but I feel like there could be a potential for students to do really well with that, but then get like totally stuck or totally blocked when it comes time for them to make their very own art. That's totally like they don't have any starting point, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. But then it could also just be for students that do already have the ideas, but are struggling to execute them. I feel like this method could be really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It would be good to just introduce a little bit of that. Mm Mm-hmm you know, not make everyone do it the entire semester or the entire year, but like introduce those concepts to give them a way to draw or a way to, you know, put on paper what they're thinking or what what they want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you find yourself using that now as well in the classroom? Yes. A lot. Yeah. I mean, the whole like breaking down an image and shapes helps me Mm -hmm. with my special ed students that Mm -hmm. I have that I want to give them some direction. Yeah, I start using the same, (laughs) the same methods to help them or even Mm -hmm. just like, you know, I'm measuring this, I'm checking this and, and then they see how, how to think through the drawing. Yeah. Yeah, I remember I have these vivid memories of the teacher showing me how to kind of measure using my pencil and my thumb, you know, like holding up your pencil arm's length and like figuring out where things are. Yes. All of those little tips and tricks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I feel like I guess we've kind of touched on this, but maybe it's a bit of your teaching coming into your art making as well. Do you Mm -hmm. feel like that? learning those techniques and then teaching those techniques, did it change the way you were making at all? Not really. So in the beginning of my teaching or now? Maybe both. (laughs) Okay. In the beginning, I think I was maybe using more of the thinking about the drawing or worrying about Mm -hmm. how everything was placed on a drawing Mm -hmm. or a painting. So yeah, I think in the beginning of my teaching career, I was implementing a lot of what I had learned from kids Mm -hmm. art where I worked and from Conchita, the Venezuelan artist. I -hmm. think I, yeah, I was putting that more into my, my artwork and in my teaching. And now I've Mm kind of like evolved or like I'm doing my own thing, but it's still there. Those ideas Mm -hmm. and skills are still there, but I'm not, I guess I'm not as thinking about it as much if that makes sense. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I feel like maybe it just becomes more intuitive. It's potentially still happening as much, but you don't have to think it through as much. Like it's sort yeah. of natural and you've you've done it so much that you just know how this sort of breaking down into shapes, you know how that works and the placement, all of that. You kind of already mm-hmm. have it figured out. Yeah. yeah. And it still helps, I guess, now that I'm thinking about it, it still helps when you're wondering how something is going or if you're looking at something and it looks off, I go back to those and I ask myself like, okay, what's wrong? What's not right here? And, and use yeah. those, use those tricks, techniques to, to fix or adjust things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that makes me think too of, I like to take a picture and make it grayscale when I feel like there's not, there's something that's not working. Is it, 
you know, something with the color? Is it? And then you do that grayscale and you're like, oh, it's like all the same value. <laughs> That's uh-huh. okay. There's the problem. That's what it was. Yes. Uh-huh. I love that. That's a good trick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, knowing all of those little tricks and mm-hmm. being able to like assess your- You fall back on them. Yep. It's just helpful to have them in your pocket. Yeah. That's what I tell the students yeah. too. You know, these are things that you could use later on. You never know. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Stick it in your back pocket. <laughs> so- I was curious about the move from especially, it sounds like you've moved quite a bit around the country, but yeah. especially that last move from Miami to Boise, like that's a really big change. Yes, it was. <laughs> yeah. How was that? I guess personally, but also in terms of teaching, like was it just totally different teaching environments? What did that look like? Yeah, a little bit. Well, first there was a culture shock. Because I hope this doesn't sound bad, but Idaho is 90% white. Yeah. And I was used to, you know, being around a lot of diversity in in the Mm -hmm. schools, you know, with the students and the teachers and coming out here, it was, you know, very, very different, very different. Right. I taught in a district previous to the district that I'm in now that was about 60% Hispanic Um, Mm -hmm. And I I use that term, even though I don't like that term, but just so that everybody understands kind of what I mean. The, the, so the student population there was 60% Hispanic and then, you know, 40% white. And so I felt good being with them. I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. But the teaching wise, it was different here. The focus of our school was something that I felt like the students already should already have from previous school. So like in Florida, there were things that that we were told to focus on, but not so much here in Idaho. I'm just going to use this example. Like when I moved here to Idaho, the principal who hired me, she said, you're going to have to implement a lot of vocabulary into their lessons. And I'm like, yeah, Mm -hmm. sure. I mean, that's a given, you know, we, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's something that I've done for a long time. And you know, she she was just reminding me, the students here, they need to build more background knowledge. They don't have a lot of background in a lot of different content mm-hmm. areas. And so that was something that I was told to focus on. And so that became a big part of my lesson plans was mm-hmm. introducing vocabulary and using the techniques that we were all asked in the building to use with vocabulary, you know, like defining it, defining it in your own words and making mm-hmm. a picture and the the picture part I, I was excited about like okay they're gonna you know create images of their vocab words not just writing them down so I did a lot of that so that was to me I felt like we were I, I was kind of moving back in terms of teaching that was like a s- step that I didn't really have mm-hmm. to focus so much on when I was in Florida mm-hmm. so yeah. And then, yeah, just culturally, it's different. But I've been living here for 12 years now. I've lived oh, here yeah. for a long time. And so now I'm more comfortable. But at first, it was difficult <laughs> mm-hmm. to find a like-minded community. And even still today, I'm still trying to reach and make connections with you know other artists like myself and try to, you know, network and get to know other Mexican Americans who live around mm-hmm. here and work with them or learn about what they're interested in too. So yeah, it's, it's coming along. Yeah. We're out here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I, so I grew up in Montana. My oh. has my husband grew up in New York and Miami oh. and anytime we think about going back to Montana moving there we're both like oh it's so beautiful there's so many great things about it but exactly like you said it's you know probably similar to Idaho like 90% white I mean just no diversity in terms of race and ethnicity at all Mm -hmm. and he's like I don't know if I can deal with that (laughs) like I don't know if I can Uh, handle that (laughs) yeah 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 it's a little tough, especially when you want to teach about certain things. And a lot of mm-hmm. the students haven't been exposed 
or Mm -hmm. they don't have the models of professionals, you know, be that artists or, you know, teachers or business uh, owners who are of, you know, who who are non-white. It's just very difficult for them because they haven't, they have never had that experience of being encountered with someone who's different. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for you to always be that example must get tiring. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I don't mind it so much, but yeah, it, 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 I mean, I kind of take it as extra work. Like Mm -hmm. one, I have to prove myself every day Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. I am different, you know, like I have to (sighs) make sure everything is what it needs to be because if I slip up it's going to look bad or you know I don't I maybe that's just something that I'm creating in my mind I do that a lot I don't think so (laughs) I hear that again and again and again from women but then especially from women of color that Mm -hmm. you're just held to a higher standard Mm -hmm. and you shouldn't be but (laughs) this you know patriarchal racist society that we live in (laughs) to get on my (laughs) like activist soapbox yeah I don't think it's at all in your head and yeah it's unfortunate that that's what we're in and hopefully we can you know change that yeah 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 (laughs) and then even talking about having to focus more on vocabulary and just sort of basic definitions that brought up this idea I was recently exposed to that's process-oriented guided inquiry learning, Mm -hmm. which I think was developed more for like the sciences. Mm -hmm. But the idea was really interesting to me in bringing it to the arts, where it's basically like showing students, like say we're talking about depth in art, Mm -hmm. Rather than giving them the word depth and defining that word and then showing a few examples of what it looks like, instead you start with the examples and like, here are some examples of ways that artists might show depth. Uh Okay, look at these, identify what's going on in each of them. And then like, so what is depth? Having the students come up with their own definition as a way of teaching that vocabulary Oh, and yeah. kind of working through this process where eventually you are sharing, mm-hmm. well, great, you made your definition. Here's now the dictionary definition or whatever. And then applying that knowledge to, okay, let's identify more depth in actual artworks and then let's use depth in our own artworks. I love that. I love that so much more. We, ha- I think we had a training on that too for English language learners, like how oh, to, yeah. yeah. So we went through that and that seems to me more of a natural way, like them discovering the right. terms instead of the teacher being the one like, you know, wah, wah, this is what it is. <laughs> no, they're right. like, they are owning the learning there. And mm-hmm. then we just, you know, nudge them or like check to see if they're under, you know, they're coming up with a good definition. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm very interested in that method of delivering new vocabulary. That's a way better way. It feels yeah, not so schooly to do it that way. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think about even like I had so many art history classes that I, you know, you asked me about the Picasso painting and I'm like, I don't know. I really like <laughs> all of those classes. I was bored out of my mind as people oh. were just like droning on with dates and names. And I was like, I don't care that this was made in 1852 or whatever. Uh Uh What does this have to do with anything? But knowing the story behind like getting to see artwork and then getting to hear a story behind the artist and how it was made. That's what I would remember. Mm -hmm. Just having that sort of discovery process rather than exactly what you said, the teacher droning on in front of the class. And yeah, yeah, that makes it more fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And then I wanted to kind of come back to this term. So you talked about, you know, in Miami, it was 60% Hispanic. And you were like, I don't like that term. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to make you go into it. (laughs) Or I mean, if you don't want to go into it, you don't have to. Um, Um, It's okay. It's okay. I mean, I think a lot of people now know like why mm -hmm. it's not a very tasteful word to use. But 
it was an it kind of an invented term, right, by the census. Mm-hmm. I can't quote you the year that it came out. Yeah. It's just a way to just, you know, put a blanket over everybody who kind of looks a certain <laughs> way or people who come from this way. And it, you know, it kind mm-hmm. of bothered me because of Columbus and, you know, mm-hmm. Cortez coming over here, you know, to Hispaniola. And like, that's not what, that's not what this part of the world was, right? It was, right. it was Mexico, it was Guatemala, it was, you know, Peru. So mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I just use that. I use that word when I don't feel like other people would follow along or understand what I'm saying. I mean, I was in a book group last year. We read the, why are all the black kids sitting together in the mm-hmm. cafeteria? And that was such yeah. a good book and study. And we talked about this. There was me and another uh, teacher who teaches psychology. She's Mexican. And <laughs> we were talking about the whole, do we like Latinx? Do we like Latina? Mm-hmm. Do we like Latino? And that, that's just something that we I've started th- thinking about more and I guess I like to always be progressive. I like mm-hmm. to always kind of be in line with how like more progressive people are thinking about things. So I mm-hmm. kind of feel most comfortable with either, you know, telling everyone like I'm Chicana, I'm Mexican American mm-hmm. or I'm Latinx to mm-hmm. include everybody to be inclusive with, you know, non-binary right. identity because we're we're all here, you know, we're not mm-hmm. just Latinos or Latinas. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I appreciate that sort of calling out the colonizer word, like mm-hmm. Hispanic is, that's really, it's from the colonizers. Yeah. And yeah. then that shift to either like the more specific Chicana or the inclusive Latinx. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's something I, I think about too, like what, you know, what term would I want to be using? What term, like what term does my husband want? What term does my daughter want? Like, uh-huh. <laughs> What would they prefer if I'm going to be talking, you know, like about them sort of, mm-hmm. what do they want me to use? Yeah. I, I haven't yeah. gotten that far, but <laughs> you know, my husband, he's, my husband is interested and curious about which term I want to use because he he doesn't want to sound bad or like he doesn't know what what I think. So we've had a discussion about it too. And but we haven't talked about how we're going to refer to our son or what yeah. 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 How old is he? <laughs> he just turned 6. Oh, yeah. so about my daughter's also 6. So mm-hmm. about the same age. Yeah, yeah. That's it's cool. So fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And then that, I mean, kind of brings me to this idea. You talked about Conchita, the artist that you worked with Uh and worked for, about her, you know, having so many children and somehow juggling an art career with parenting. And I'm curious how you manage that, you know, the juggle of teaching, making art, being an artist and being a parent, being, you know, present in your relationship, all of these, you know, other things that come into life. Yeah. How, so how do you manage it all? Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> or not? <laughs> yeah. Well, when he was really little, I was working full time. And mm-hmm. my husband is also a teacher too. So we we had the mm-hmm. same schedule. We both teach high school. So we have to wake up really early. So when he was really little we would get him up and take him to daycare. And, uh, you know, it was a ridiculous time. I was dropping him off at like 630 in the morning. And then my husband would pick him up at like around four. So our son was Mm -hmm. there all day, you know, one day a week, he was with his grandma, which was really nice because, you know, it's stressful for little kids. We Mm -hmm. don't think about how stressful it is for them to be around so many other kids. And, but, I still wanted to work full time. So Mm -hmm. we would do the after school routine. We would have dinner together. My husband and I would trade off who would exercise and Mm -hmm. we would alternate who would cook. And then Mm -hmm. after Elio was in bed, I would stay up and work on all my lesson plans. This is when he was little, like 
I would lesson plan, I would grade, like that whole having to work my butt off to make sure that I was ready and prepared and didn't look mm-hmm. like an idiot in front of kids. <laughs> yeah. So I was doing that every night. And mm-hmm. when he was like four, I was starting to kind of like break down. I was like, Mm -hmm. this is exhausting. This is so much. And there were a lot of other things at school that were going on behavior wise. Managing the classroom just started getting to me. And Mm -hmm. I was wanting to, with my son being born, I had this renaissance kind of experience. Like, I want to make sure I'm getting my artwork out there. So I was also putting the pressure on myself to make my art. So I did a lot of crying and my Mm -hmm. husband (laughs) was like, why don't you just stop teaching and work on your artwork? And I was like, what? Mm. How? And so he had always said that to me throughout Mm. our whole marriage. You know, you should just focus on your artwork, do a job that you can do your artwork and not have to have extra work. And Mm -hmm. that sounded crazy to me. But in 20, at the end of 2019, I left my teaching job at my Mm. old district with this plan that I was going to, you know, build up my artwork and focus on that. But at the same time, I still had to have a job. So I was working at a job, but not having that work at home kind of thing. So now I decided to go back to the classroom because I didn't like the instability of like the financial Mm -hmm. instability that that was a big thing. But then the other thing was I was still looking for ways to teach people. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It was like talking to the art supply store, like, Hey, could I teach a class here? Or I was (laughs) going to the Hispanic cultural center and saying like, Hey, wouldn't it be cool if we did a family night and the kids could come in and they could make something or could I teach the art class here? And so there was still like inside teaching in me. Like I wanted to, to give, sorry, I'm getting emotional, but um, no, I wanted to yeah. give other people what I loved. So, mm. so it was partly, I liked the fact that I was getting paid to do something that I loved, right? The, mm-hmm. the paycheck. But then at the same time, having students who wanted to learn was something that I felt like I needed to go back into the classroom. I love it. You can never really leave teaching. Yeah. It's been part of me since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. But now I only teach a little over half time. I only teach Mm -hmm. four groups. We're on a block Mm -hmm. schedule. So in the morning, now now that my son's in kindergarten, I could take him to school. And he doesn't Mm -hmm. have to wake up at six o'clock in the morning. And I don't have to take him to a before care place. I take him to school and then after I drop him off at school, I go to my high school and my husband picks him up. But the the time that I have in the morning, I'm either working on some final things for school or I'm writing down what I need to do for the week or the day in my notebook. I'll check on things that need to get done administratively or I'll check in with my art group in the morning Mm -hmm. (laughs) on Marco Polo. So I have time in the morning and then I'm able to, now that I only have four classes, I'm able to stay organized because I made it in my mind that I would come up with a way to stay more organized, not have this like long, 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 long list of things that I needed to do, but just focus on the things that had to get done on certain days. So that helps me to not feel that burnout. But I mean, now it's just, just now I was telling a friend of mine yesterday, I finally now feel comfortable with the schedule of having some time in the morning, being at school, getting my work done at school, and then coming home and Sometimes I have to do work at home, but for the most part on certain nights when my husband reads to my son before bed, I get to be in my, my art studio, my, my little studio I have in my house, and I get to work, yeah. on, work on my stuff. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love hearing all of that, just like finding the balance, figuring out 
Because I feel like so many people can probably relate to that feeling of burnout and just like, it's too much. What do I, how do I do this? How do I deal with it? And I just want to say that I sought out how other teachers did it. There's a teacher Mm -hmm. that I follow. Her name's Brianne Beebe. I love her so much. She's Mm -hmm. She's a math teacher, but she shares on YouTube and on Instagram, like her systems for staying organized and and Mm -hmm. grading. And I, I have used her suggestions. I've used her tips to keep myself not having to work until midnight on school Mm -hmm. stuff. So yeah, it helps a lot. Yeah, that's huge. Mm -hmm. And seeking out, I'll have to get her links so I can Mm -hmm. share that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, absolutely. Seeking out like, how do other people handle this? And then For me, it's been a lot of, and it sounds like for you also, kind of trial and error almost, like figuring out, okay, maybe this will work. No, I need to shift it a little bit to fit Mm -hmm. me and how I function and how my life is. Yeah. I can't say that I'm perfect at it because my husband Mm -hmm. will attest to this. I'm not a creature of habit, Mm -hmm. but but I think (laughs) the more I stick to it or the more I try to you know, stick to having a schedule, stick to only doing certain school tasks on certain days, Mm -hmm. then it'll just give me, it'll allow me more time. It's not always the best day. It's not always the best week, but it it helps in in what I can when I use those systems or schedule techniques. Yeah, Mm -hmm. definitely. And then also, I feel like maybe on sort of on a bigger scale that you have sort of figured out what works for you in terms of, or at least for now, what works in terms of career balance, like having mm-hmm. sort of part-time teaching, part-time art making, and yes. and still time for parenting. Yeah. Just finding that balance. I feel like there's never quite a balance, <laughs> mm-hmm. but finding some way that you're not constantly sort of teetering. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh. Yes. Because, I mean, I don't know where it comes from. It must come from my upbringing, but, you know, putting all into your work, like your professional work, like the work that you get paid for was Mm -hmm. like what I was focusing on so much. And that really wasn't where I I should have been focusing. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also like we're moving towards allowing people the whole mental health, like everybody making sure that they're good mentally, not just financially, or I think us moving towards that is going to help a lot more people, you know, not the whole focusing on working 13 hours a day for a paycheck, you know, is like the most important. So I'm glad we're shifting our thinking a little bit. Or yeah, some people definitely. are feeling okay to shift into thinking that they don't have to kill themselves <laughs> for, mm-hmm. for their job. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it is so real. Like I know you mentioned at one point that it felt too, like it felt unstable financially to not yeah. be working. Like you're like, I can't not have a job, but maybe I can kind of scale that back a little bit. Yes. And I like that way of thinking about it and also just sharing that reality. Like most of us probably can't afford to just say, no, I I think I'm just going to make art and not teach anymore <laughs> like tomorrow. Yeah. You know? and, yeah. And yeah. that, I mean, the other part of that was I grew up with my mom working all mm-hmm. the time. And, you know, I just always fell back on that. My parents were a 50-50 team, you know, and mm-hmm. so I wanted to to be that way too with with my family like I wanted to eat I I know I don't equally contribute but (laughs) I wanted to contribute as much as I could to our family to our household and not just be the one who is getting to to make my art and to (laughs) to be at home more so that's just my personal thing why you know I also wanted to have that financial stability to not put it all on one person in the house yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're right. I think that's a like very sort of individual thing, you mm-hmm. know, each family kind of figuring it out what works for them. Yeah. And then there's always the costs of childcare and mm-hmm. 
especially when you start having more and more kids. Like I see so many families saying what the mom or the whoever, whichever parent stays home, like would have been making would go entirely just to yeah. like daycare. So it doesn't yeah. make sense at one point Yes, for them to work. It's mm-hmm. like <laughs> yeah. those costs kind of balance each other out. I guess what I wanted to say is that there's contributions that you're making that might not be financial. Yeah. That you're, yeah. That's true. That's true. But I think it comes from the, uh, the parents who wanted to live the American dream, kind of like, you got to work hard. You got to work every day. (laughs) Right. That That kind of like mind training still has a hold on me. Um, totally. And to this day. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That makes sense. And then with your artwork and your art career, do you have any advice that you would give other artists, other teachers who are trying to make that time, but also trying to figure out how do I get into galleries? How do I sell my work? Like, what do I, what do I do there? Oh, okay. Well, when I was still at my old district, I worked with another art teacher. She was involved in a local artists alliance. So Mm -hmm. she was the one who introduced me to, you know, there's this group and you can show your work and they have monthly or, you know, they do calls for submissions for specific themes. So I kind of started off with that, like thinking about whatever theme that they were throwing out there. So, you know, seeking out local groups who are Mm -hmm. supporting other artists was kind of how I started. And I, I recommend it to, you know, everybody too. And then from there, I think that's when I started listening to all of the artists podcasts, you know, like Mm -hmm. work and share it. And so I was working a lot in my visual journal. I was teaching students how to use their sketchbooks as more than just, you know, a little sketch pad. They were making pages that had like layers in them. And Mm -hmm. I was doing that alongside them. And I learned that from another art teacher in our area to incorporate that into the classroom. And I loved it. Mm -hmm. And so I just always kept my visual journal in the classroom and I would work alongside Mm -hmm. the students. So any opportunity to like do what they're doing is inspiring. It shows the students how to work, how to, you know, you're modeling Mm -hmm. for them, how to be an artist. So I still try to do that. And then I have subscriptions to all of those newsletters that come out like art deadlines, the call Mm. for art, the call for entry newsletters. And so Mm -hmm. I scan and I pick things that I want to submit to. I just try to go for as many opportunities as I can. Mm -hmm. And I think about like the deadlines and I'm also trying to participate in our local art scene. So Mm -hmm. I've shown my work in a couple of local places. So whenever I see those things pop up, I just, you know, put my name out there like, hey, can I do this? Or now Mm -hmm. more recently, people have been asking me, can you do this? Do you have work that you want to show? So I'm always like, yeah, sure. I'm always a willing participant. But I can't say that I'm an established artist or anything like that, because Mm -hmm. I still feel like I'm still like re-emerging. I say Mm re-emerging because... I feel like I was emerging, but then teaching kind of took its place in my Mm -hmm. priorities. And then after having my son, I like kind of went back to it. So I still feel like I'm still building, still growing. But what I have been able to do in the last five years, I'm really happy about just starting, you know, just getting Mm -hmm. my artwork out and, you know, meeting other artists. That's been very rewarding to me is just saying that I wanted to go back to my art and then seeing where it's come is is really, really, it's a really good feeling to to look back. Uh, I love that term, you know, saying you're re-emerging. I <laughs> feel exactly the same. I'm like, yeah, I guess I was an emerging artist like 10 years ago, but then I got sidetracked and <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, never really totally emerged. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's great. And then such good advice about starting locally and just getting to know the local sort of scene. Yeah. And then I love what you said, too, about now people are starting to kind of come to you. I feel like that probably t- took some time to get there. Like, mm-hmm. 
you know, getting known locally a little bit within the art world, like whatever the art world in Boise is. <laughs> yeah, it's growing. And I definitely yeah. want to be part of it to see it get bigger and be involved in more things. And mm-hmm. yeah, so I think I think I'm in a pretty good spot right now. I want to be more active, but I yeah. have you know, I have to balance, right? <laughs> to keep it yeah. keep the balance. Yes. Yeah. But it's sort of a regional center. Like it's a big city for that area, Mm -hmm. starting locally and then taking the time to build that up until it becomes like they're asking you to do things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But just kind of acknowledging that takes, that probably took you a few years. Yes. Yes. Because I mean, you know, making paintings, finishing paintings, for me, mm-hmm. it takes longer because I don't have as many hours. So <laughs> I mm-hmm. I was looking back, like, how many pieces do I have in this series now? Oh, yeah, I have 10. For sure, I have 10. And so, mm-hmm. But it's taken me a while to, to get those done and out in the world. But I'm satisfied with, with that number, just with everything else that has to be yeah. done. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And then what is your process like? Do the do the visual journals sort of does that become almost like a starting point for work? Or is it more just kind of getting ideas down on paper? Yeah. Yeah. How does your what's your process like? Yeah. So the process that I use for my mixed media pieces, Mm -hmm. it started in the visual journal, Mm -hmm. you know, like getting rid of the white on the page and then collaging Mm -hmm. and adding more marks and then drawing on top. So the mixed media series that I have right now came from that. I was taking Mm -hmm. a class with that other art teacher who was teaching other art teachers how to do visual journals in their class. Julie Shelton, shout out. She's so awesome. She shares all of her ideas and she put together a class for these art teachers and she gave us an assignment, right? Like, now you guys are going to make a piece that's unbound from your journal. And I was like, mm. oh, okay. Ooh. So I made a piece on bark paper. We call it amate paper. And I had a whole, a couple of sheets of this paper. And that was my first mixed media piece that wasn't in the journal. So Sometimes I work on papers, but I mostly like to work on wood panels because I can layer more. The The surface will support the layering and the gluing. Yeah. So my mixed media work has a lot of texture. Since I use acrylic mediums and gels, the surface will resemble kind of like a crumbling wall that's stained with colors and I cover parts of the surface with collaged images that I find in National Geographics. I I don't know. I love National Geographics. Just the quality, yeah. the quality of the paper and the imagery. Mm. I just respond to, and I also have all of these stamps from letters that mm. my family members have sent back and forth from Mexico in mm. the eighties. And so I put those into these pieces, and then I paint figures or portraits on top. And right now the portraits, the figures have been family members for the most part, but so I've been using old photos. But I also source images from friends that I make on Instagram. So <laughs> I see nice. your picture and I'm like, can I use your picture? It's so pretty. Yeah. And and usually they're like, yes, that's fine. So yeah, that's kind of what that work is like right now. But I'm now going back to oil painting and I want to create oil paintings that look like they're collaged, but they're not. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> that's tricky. Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of exploring that it's very exploratory right now. The mixed media stuff I feel the most comfortable with. It's like my safety net. Like, Oh, I know how to do this. <laughs> I can do this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that idea though of, Like, I feel like maybe it'll be kind of a back and forth for a while that you'll be you'll have some mixed media pieces going and then you'll be kind of working on these oil pieces like this idea of almost what is that word? Trump lol. I don't know how to say it. Yes, (laughs) where you're Uh like, right, making it look like it's collaged, but it's not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I'm not really seeking a very graphic 
look Mm -hmm. not like a photorealist kind of collage effect but Mm -hmm. just the whole layering of imagery creating the composition with all of these different parts and pieces and kind of weaving them together yeah yeah (laughs) yeah and just looking through your work I love how it does weave these parts and pieces and there's textures and I feel like I would need to see it in person to really see everything going on because there is so much in there yeah (laughs) but really beautiful work thank you (laughs) yeah And then I did want to give you a chance to share if there was anything we kind of missed. Is there anything you wanted to touch on that we didn't get to? No, well, there was like, I really love the question that you had about what advice would you give new teachers? Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to add that new teachers should really collaborate and network with other art teachers as much as they can Mm -hmm. because you learn so much from others who've had different experiences or have different strengths. And I just wanted to add that collaboration is so good. And I feel like it fills me up whenever I get to talk to other art teachers. And I've kept friendships with other art teachers the whole time that I've been a teacher. And I, I just love that we have that combined experience of, you know, making art and and teaching others. So I wanted to add that. And then I also wanted to add it for new art teachers that you should really make sure you advocate for your art room and what you Mm. do and what happens in that room, because it'll dispel the myth that all we do in the art room is like play with crayons. And, Mm. you know, we don't really teach in there, but we do, right? And we make kids think and we make them problem solve. So advocating for the arts is something that I feel very strongly about it, just like collaboration. So that's all. That's all I wanted to add. Yeah, no, I love that. Those are both really, really good tips and totally agree with both with the advocating. It makes me frustrated that we have to do that, but Mm -hmm. it's you know, what science teacher is having to go advocate for the importance of science or math or, you know, any other teacher. Like yes. why other subjects don't have to do that. Why are we constantly having to prove the like legitimacy of our subject, mm-hmm. of our field? Mm-hmm. But we do. So yeah. part of the job. <laughs> yep. So continuing to do that, each one of us, every little mind we can change. Yes, yes. Okay, I just have my sort of the questions I always ask, the fun kind of wrap-up questions. So Mm -hmm. one is, what are you curious about right now? Oh, I'm definitely super curious right now about oil painting. Like I said before, I'm revisit, I I call it a revisit to the medium because I was working with it most exclusively before I got into the mixed media work. But I'm really trying to see if I can make work like I do with acrylic, but oil painting, like if anyone hasn't worked with it before, it's just the translucency of the paint is what I love the most. Mm. It's just building up the layers and I'm trying to find a way to make it, you know, more layered the way that I can in acrylic. So that's, that's my curiosity right now. (laughs) It makes me think about encaustic for you. (sighs) I don't know if you've explored that at all. You have tried it before, but I, mm. I don't know. I, I don't know what it. I might need to, yeah, go back to that. But it, mm. it's just something else, like another look that I'm trying to go for. So, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then, kind of fun, silly, just like get to know you question. What is your favorite food? Oh, Mexican food, of course. Yeah, <laughs> you're like gotta go yeah. back to the roots. <laughs> oh, kidding. Well, I mean, yes, I do love Mexican food. I just want to say that I love mole negro. That is like mm. my dish. If anybody hasn't ever tried it, you need to. But yeah, mole. Mm. Yeah. And then is there anyone you'd want to give sort of a thank you or a shout out to? I have kind of a long list. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> My husband, for sure, Matt, he's always supported my work and he's a teacher and a writer himself. He's going Mm. through his MFA and teaching. So yeah, Mm. I love him so much. And I wouldn't be able to do what I do without him helping Mm. our household organized and 
my son. I learned so much from watching him draw and create mm-hmm. and my parents for giving me the space to follow my own path. Other supportive art teachers who've stuck by me, even though I thought I was done teaching, they they stayed friends with me when I decided to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Christy Wilkins and Anika Sakugawa and Marie Caldwell, Laura Ritzer, Kristen Mao, Jed Benedict, and my new collaborator, Chloe Miller. And mm. last but not least, the artist mother crew that I have, Isadora, our mentor, mm. and Ellen and Valentine. Thank you so much for being there for me when I need to talk to somebody about my artwork. (laughs) Mm, Awesome. That sounds like a great group of people. Yeah. (laughs) So important to have those supporters. Yeah, I'm lucky. I'm super Uh, lucky and grateful. mm -hmm. And then last thing, where can listeners find you and connect with you online? Oh, on Instagram, I'm Nana Chicana Art. That is probably the best, most updated place to see my work. And I have a website. I'm going to switch it soon. But my website is marianajedwardsart.com. Awesome. And I will link to all of that as well. And if you do switch it, I'll link to the updated oh, okay. version. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mariana. Yeah. This Thank was you wonderful. For your time. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. As always, you can reach me at Teaching Artist Podcast on Instagram or Teaching Artist Podcast at gmail.com. Who do you want to hear from? Please share your recommendations of teaching artists. And if you loved this episode, please subscribe, leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts, and follow me. It really makes a big difference. Thank you. Thank you.